Okay, we're back with Ravenloft, and uh, we've come to a fork in the road while we're following the trail of ghosts up to Ravenloft Castle. And <clears throat> our friends, our old friends, who are now ghost friends, are paused there, ghost-like, at the fork in the road, and are looking at us, meaningful, looking down this one other fork, rather than the one that they're traveling up. The, the rest of the ghosts are traveling up to the mountains. The left fork slants upward, heading into the mountains, the road where the spirits continue to travel, and the right fork slants slightly downward toward what looks like the base of the mountains rather than the peaks. At the fork, I see Liqua uh, standing next to, or Lika, standing next to Reinhardt. They're both staring silently down the right hand downward traveling path away from the route that the other spirits have taken. Reinhardt regards the smaller path solemnly and then turns to me. As I approach, the two spirits stare meaningfully at us. They don't say anything. Uh, they look back at the smaller path and then turn, seeming exhausted, and trudge up the larger road to the rest of the that the rest of the spirits have taken, leaving me at the crossroads with a decision to make. I'm heading right. It seems like there are clues to be found. Okay. Ah, color text. The canopy of mist and branches overhead suddenly gives way to a clearing. A wide spot in the river. Dry grass rustles in the wind. Colorful wagon are parked along the banks of a pool. The strains of an accordion mixed with a somewhat desultorily, desultory uh, fiddle and the sound of the trees. Several, perhaps as many as ten brightly clad figures are surrounding a large roaring fire. The seldom used road passes close by this camp. As I approach, several voices call out, Hail from the fire! Join our singing and break bread with us! Which is a traditional greeting amongst the mysterious travelers known as the Vastani. I'm a little surprised uh, to realize now I'm, I'm stealing a little bit of this from um, the traveling performers from the name of the wind series because Vistani are really sketched very thinly and I'm gonna say problematically stereotyped in the original Ravenloft book so um, we're trying to go a little bit more broadly with this and that's where I'm pulling some of that in inspiration i'm a little surprised to realize that they know i'm here as i'm still pretty far from the firelight but they seem friendly enough as we approach they wave us in toward the fire and offer bread and a skin of wine his mark and irena accept both of them graciously irena in particular seems comfortable with the fireside etiquette no that's not fair both of them are quite familiar with it but it's more surprising to me that irena can tip a wine skin back and get a perfect stream into her mouth his mark seems more like the type you know. I accept both the bread and the wine, taking what hospitality requires, and ask the Vistani why they make camp so close to the castle up in the mountains. The pool next to their camp lies near a waterfall that tumbles from the heights above out of the mountain. And Irina glances at that pool often. They shrug it off a bit. We know how to stay safe from the night creatures, they say. But at the same time, none of them actually look up at the high cliffs where the castle looms far overhead. Also, one adds, poking the fire and not looking at us strictly. Madame Eva told us that we might have visitors tonight, so we waited here. If you are willing, she wanted to speak. They nod in the direction of one of the wagons, not the largest, but the most brightly painted. We spend a few more minutes with the Vistani, so as not to seem rude, and then I use the lateness of the hour as an excuse to visit Madame Eva quickly. Spooky fortune teller. We can check off another bingo box in the creepy fantasy story, right? I like this screenshot. It, this is not her, but uh, I still like this as a fortune teller. Anyway, the other one's a little bit distracting. Uh, Madame Eva doesn't even look up when I enter the shrouded door of her wagon. She's shuffling and dealing an oversized deck of cards onto a small table in front of her. Uh, for this, I'm representing how this thing goes with a gather information roll. Uh, we're gonna check that one out. That's a strong hit on gather information, which I'm going to just let ride throughout the scene since it's potentially chock-a-block with information both explicit and vagued up. Since I get a strong hit on it, I'm going to be a little bit less vague. Uh, it's fortune teller stuff, so it's always going to be a little bit vague, but I'm going to be try, try to help things along with the NPC observations as much as I can to kind of make things clearer. I say, um, they said that the fire that you wanted to talk with, they lied to you at the fire. She glances up and catches my expression. Oh, not about that. I did want to talk to you, all of you. But the reason we don't have to worry about von Zerovic is because some of our people do his bidding and you and have ensured, they believe, the family's safety from his other minion. She makes a show of spitting to the side in disgust. Do they really believe he'll leave your family alone? I ask trying to seem unperturbed at being surrounded by enemies. Madame Eva shrugs. He has, for several generations. We are useful. 
to it. Again, she looks disgusted. Her eyes flicker up to us, then to the cards. But I can see you will attempt to bring the monster down, or and I would offer you what guidance I can, she says, gesturing to the cards spread in front of her and the stools on our side of the table. You look at the future, I ask, easing into the leftmost stool. I'm assuming in vague bits and pieces that we'll only understand when it's too late. She shrugs again, unoffended, while Ismark and Irina join me. The images I see are often incomplete, but combined with wisdom and insight, she smirks. And a little bit of luck. They can help you. I tilt my head toward her. Well, I appreciate any help I can get. Excellent. She gathers up the cards, shuffles them, and has me cut the deck before she begins to deal out an array. She lays five cards out, face down, and then slowly turns each one of them over and studies each one before speaking. These may tell you more of the things you seek and whisper what the monster's ultimate goal. And thus, a new oracle enters the game, the famous slash infamous fortune-telling straight from Ravenloft I-6. Sorting out this draw when I first played through it uh, took quite a while, actually. So we're going to take a look at, one of the, at each of these in turn, all five of them. She indicates the first card. This card represents an object of great power, a powerful force for good, and protection against the forces of darkness. It is in a place of tranquility, a harbor for the mighty and powerful, a place of wisdom and warmth and despair. Great secrets are here, Irina whispers. Father's holy symbol that was stolen. And I nod. That was what I was thinking. Madame Eva taps the next card. This card is good for you. It is a card of power and strength. It is a victor's card. It tells of a weapon of light, a weapon with a vengeance. You may find this amid the ruins of a place of supplication and prayer. Ismark says, that sounds promising. I rock my head to the left and the right. I'm not getting my hopes up. Madame Eva touches the next card. This card speaks of history. Knowledge of the ancient may help you understand your foe. This knowledge lies in the monster's mother's place. His mark makes a face. That's probably the book the priest was yammering on about. I say maybe. I don't fancy digging around in his mother's 400-year-old unmentionables looking for it. Irina rolls her eyes. Next. This is the object of your search. The monster itself. I see darkness and evil behind this card. A powerful man whose enemy is light and whose powers are beyond mortality. She closes her eyes, considering. A king's throne is the place to find him. Subtle, his mark says. The cup indicates there is very good influence there. If you are there, the powers of good will aid you. It doesn't surprise me to hear that Count Strahd would surround himself in the symbols of royalty. It does surprise me to hear that there's some hint that he may be at a disadvantage in that place, which I am definitely making a note of in case we face off in some kind of throne room, because I will use that as a MacGuffin. Uh, the thing with the game is that, as I've said before, it's very, very difficult to face off against like epic foes or, or um, even extreme foes, because uh, you have to do a lot of stuff to them, a lot of damage to them, uh, a lot of successful hits, without taking hits in return, because when they hit you, they hit really flippin' hard. Um, so I like to avoid that if I can. Things like this uh, are the kind of thing that go, okay, well, because we're in the throne room and because the forces of good are on our side, we're not gonna treat him like an epic, we're gonna treat him like an extreme. And maybe I've got some other MacGuffin, some special weapon, like they talk about in this, that uh, is particularly effective against him or a holy symbol is particularly effective against him or anything, and maybe that moves him from extreme down to formidable. Now things are getting much more manageable. So, uh, I like the sound of that. Finally, Madame Ava's eyes are still closed when she reaches out and touches the last card. Here is the root. The reason and foundation for darkness and chaos. This card shows the purpose of all things. It is a key to life and death and beyond. Her eyes open wide. The darkness loves a light and desires it. She looks at Irina, who goes pale. Great plans are in motion about you. Plans of the dead may find warmth from the living. Like hell, I mutter. I study the cards for a minute and then stand. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us, but if you don't mind, we'll be on our way. My people do not feel as I do about the monster in that castle, Madame Eva says as I step toward the door of the wagon. She is not nearly as old as I'd first assumed. Many simply ignore him. Some serve him. You may encounter them when you reach the castle, or even before then, I cannot say. Her jaw clenches, her dark eyes are bright, but know that some that oppose him, and I am one, there are some that oppose him, and I am one of them. And I hope that this helps you as much as it can, you and your friends, she says, looking mostly at Arena. The ghosts are gone, 
well ahead by the time we return to the main road. And with that, I am marking off milestones for a couple of different vows related to Strahd because we got a lot of information and I'm hoping that uh, we recognize it when it's actually useful. The other thing that's actually uh, important to note about this is I messed up. I didn't mess up. I missed an opportunity. It would be really cool if I had sworn a vow to Madame Eva to try to free the Vistani from Strahd's influence. That would have been really uh, kind of a cool thing to do, to figure out some way to do that. But uh, I didn't, so that's not... And you know what it is, is uh, it's it's something that uh, it never occurred to me to do uh, because it's I, I got in the mindset of the old module and you really can't... Um, you know, they're, they're not meant to be people that you keep coming back and interacting with the villages kind of, but, but not so much the, the Vistani. And as such, I never thought of them as like a place that I could like, like a second community that I could actually like work with and form a bond with and stuff like that. So thus far, at least it's, it's an opportunity I haven't been able to take advantage of. I might, I might go back there and see. If I... Um, one of the other things I find really cool about Ironsworn is interacting with Ravenloft with Ironsworn, the list of stuff um, that this card reading lays out for me in the original module and when I ran it in World of Dungeons These are your basic magic weapons and holy symbols with just bonuses to specific foes or they give you bonuses to turning undead or Whatever that's fine in Ironsworn on the other hand the event basically lays out a roadmap for acquiring stuff that will make Strad beatable Maybe I mean I've set him in the related quest up as epic and without boring everyone uh, again about this one versus one person one v one versus an epic foe is pretty much self-inflicted death set. however it's very straightforward in iron sworn to say this thing lowers the threat level of a particular thing or category of thing so if you get magic weapon plus this thing and fight the guy in this blessed location you can through significant prep work all of which conveniently advances the quest completion itself get the big boss showdown down to something that's manageable which in every version of the game, whether that's D&D &D or World of Darkness or Ironsworn or whatever, is the point of the stuff in the first place. It's it's just it's just really neat how Ironsworn does it. I, I like it a lot. Okay, so we leave the Vistani camp behind, and from there we move up the other path towards the gates of Castle Ravenloft. Uh, at this point in time, while I was playing the game, I got sick for about a week and was finally feeling well enough to get back to Brigida and Ismark and Irina. Uh, during the break, I spent a bit of time wondering if I'd missed a chance to swear that vow to Matt and Eva. That was when it first occurred to me. Um, and I, Honestly, I was never so far along in the story at that point that I couldn't go back and retcon the vow, but I decided not to, mostly because I, at the time I was thinking, well, it's redundant to the other vows I already have. And, and because I, I just have one more open vow slot left and I wanted to save it for something different, though. We'll see. Now then. Uh, so once again, we've continued up the dark, fog-shrouded road. Dead leaves crackling underfoot road splits in two again after several miles a narrower road curving back northeast continues toward the castle while a broader track road leaves west into the heart of the mountains and the dense forest beyond cobblestones still show up in patches on both of them but neither of the roads have seen much attention or traffic these days i decide to consult uh, ironsworn's oracle to see whether or not i'm going to stick with the cliche thing at the crossroads that's in the module uh where there's like a a a, a horse and carriage waiting for us uh i don't think it's likely and the oracle agrees with me so we are tossing the two horse court two horse carriage waiting for us um, after passing between the nearest peaks the narrower road narrow narrower road takes a sudden turn around the shoulder of a granite and a startling awesome presence of ravenloft itself towers ahead and above us and actually i think this is a pretty good CGI model of the of the thing. I think this is from D and D Online, maybe or something. I don't know. Ismark comes to a stop just in front of the twin gate guard houses of turreted stone, broken from years of exposure. Beyond these, a 20-foot wide crevice gapes between the cliff and the walls of the castle, a chasm that disappears into the darkness below. A lower drawbridge of old shorn-up wood beams sags slightly between us and the arched arched entrance of the courtyard the slack chains of the drawbridge creak in the wind a rotting wooden portcullis green with verdigris hangs above 
the entry tunnel. Green with growth. Basically this, although maybe without the incredible swarm of crows we see. Um, through the gates and on the far side of the courtyard, the main doors of Castle Ravenloft stand open. A rich, warm light spills out into the courtyard and torches flutter sadly in sconces on both sides of the open doors of the castle. If I want to go in, pretty much the only way across is the drawbridge, which looks reasonably sound, but also like it's definitely suffering from long years of exposure. So it's not a question of where we're going, but how we're going, whether we go in like we were invited or go quick and quiet and try to get out of sight. So we definitely want to sneak in. Yeah, and I'm definitely not going to start things off with that crappy roll. So I'm going to just burn my momentum and get into the castle a little further than the front gates before things go completely south. What this does by burning my momentum, I don't get to keep the double challenge dice and say, oh, well, I beat them. The dice are wiped away, so I don't get the benefit of the paired dice, um, but I do get the strong hit. The dice themselves are technically gone. The drawbridge looks a bit rough, but it's more than strong enough for three people walking. Once through the portcullis and into the proper entry, we can either go right up to the right up to the front doors of the castle, no, or sort of circle around the castle out in the courtyard and see if we can find an alternate entrance by going around the main building. Um, let's take a look at the map. The gates we're entering then are right there on the left and oops oh that was stupid that bigger again the gates we're entering in there are on the left uh the main courtyard a little second red dot there um our entrance or we can circle around to the left or the right thick cold fog swirls around in this darkened courtyard it's late at night sporadic flashes of lightning are lancing the clouds overhead but they're too far away to cause much thunder. There's a bit of light rain coming down spor sporadically. Directly ahead, the large main doors of the castle are wide open. Warm light spills from those open doors into the courtyard. It looks very inviting, if you're not me. The dark towers of the keep loom above in the mists and the drizzle. Ismark eyes the open doors of the castle. I am concerned that they're expecting. His tone is flat with irony. Brigitte uh, might be able to explore the courtyard around to the northern side of the castle where I can see carriage tracks are worn into the damp ground, or south and around, which seem to see less traffic. So this is basically us, the ways we can circle around the front gates. Um, Brig could also maybe try to get up on top of the wall, along the walkways, but with the mist and the rain, the walls are gonna be quite slick and, and pretty hard to climb. Probably gonna have to, it's probably an iron check to get up on the wall, but before that, I'd probably have to face danger to see whether or not I even can do it safely. After a bit of pondering, uh, Brig opts to hit south, and around the castle. At this point in time, I didn't really have much skin in the game because I was kind of, until I ran out of sort of moves, I was emulating what my daughter had done when we ran this thing on World of Darkness. Just in generally, like when it came to choices like this, I, well, what did she do at the time? Um, until I ran out of, until it, things deviated too far for it to make any sense. The walls of the castle don't have many arrow slits or windows in the front half of the side courtyard. And those that do, such as right off this corner tower, uh, let, a, let into rooms that are completely dark. It's impossible to make out anything inside these tower rooms. A massive wall separates the side courtyards front and back, that wall that's just past number three there, and connects the walls of the castle to the outer walls of the keep. So if we're up on the walls, we could walk into the castle at some high, on some higher floor if we were up on the walls. The big wall right here is pierced by a single gate, 20 feet wide, leading through the joining wall. The gate is blocked by a rusting portcullis, which is, after I check the oracle to see whether or not it's raised, which I think is unlikely, and I get a no, not raised. Brig will have to try to move it to keep going here or double back. Luckily, she is strong and strong enough to give it a try. So I'm going to face danger using iron. I could maybe be using some of the rules from Delve here, but I'm I was still sick. I didn't want to have to get into the delve rules just yet, although I will be doing that pretty soon. So I'm going to try to face iron, or sorry, face danger using iron. And that is a weak hit on face danger. On a weak hit, you succeed, but face a troublesome cost. You can choose one. You are delayed, lose advantage, or face a new danger. Suffer minus one momentum. You are tired or hurt, endure harm. You are dispirited or afraid, endure stress, or you can sacrifice resources, suffer minus one supply. So minus one momentum kind of sucks since I'm already down to two since I just burned momentum to get in here. But I like that option better than anything else. Um, you are delayed, lose advantage, or face a new danger and suffer minus one momentum. Face a new danger. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Brigitte strains to lift the massive iron portcullis, pushing it up 
through the rusting grooves in the gate opening and with a bit of Ismark's help manages to get it up to about shoulder height barely at which point he and Irina slip underneath and through the gate and I try to figure out how I'm going to get through and let the gate down without alerting the whole castle to our location. Ismark and Irina have backed away from the portcullis to give me room to get under and dive away from the gate if that's what I decide to do and they're both watching me so they don't see the hulking humanoid shadow rise up from the eaves of the castle several floors above us and drop silent as a cat on soft grass into the stone courtyard behind them with its broad wings flaring again my two companions aren't looking in that direction but with ismark's torch raised up high i can see the looming form of one of the castle gargoyles come to life through some horrid magic and coming straight toward them so brigitte just brigitte just uh drops the gate and charges okay so it looks like time for the first actual fight in the iron swarm system so i figure out to take at least take the time to make sure i get it right there are a few more moving pieces with combat than with some other situations because role-playing game anyway first let's review this is about where the uh can't see it this is about where the gargoyle dropped from there's me holding up the portcullis or roundabout ismark and irena are right here and this is where the gargoyle lands so he's right behind it's right behind them, coming up on them, and I'm at the gate. Now, Brig has pushed up the rusty portcullis, separating the southern forecourt from the hind court, and Ismark and Irene have scrambled through. I was left to figure out how to get the gate down and get out from under the thing without making a god-awful racket and alert the whole castle. While this is happening, Gargoyle drops down from the buttresses above into the courtyard just behind the Kolyanas. Brig's choices got a lot simpler and a lot in a big hurry. Brig charges... And the first thing I'm wondering is whether that gate's going to come crashing down right away. It could. I could make it a move. But honestly, there's not a lot of skill being applied here. It's just dumb luck. And I guess there's about a 50-50 chance that the rusted track of the porkless lets the porkless slam back down versus not. So I just roll. I get a 21, which means the result is no. So, okay, the gate is a little shimmied in the track. And when I lunge free, it slips a couple inches, gets hung up and cockeyed, and it just sticks. Lucky for us. Brigida charges at and past her new friends, both of them wide-eyed and a little bit surprised. Years of training making the umlimbering of my shield and my mace an automatic thing. Let's take a look at our first little image that we need to worry about here, or the move that we need to worry about here. This is enter the fray. When you enter into combat, set the rank of each of your foes. Troublesome foes mean that every hit and every harm that you inflict inflicts three progress. Dangerous foes, you inflict two progress every time you inflict harm. Formidable, you inflict one harm, one progress for every harm, and they inflict three harm on you. So, so their harm increases as they get more dangerous, the harm that they inflict, and the amount of damage that they take every time that you do harm to them, decrease. So you see how they get tougher. Then roll to determine who is in control. If you are facing off against your foe, roll plus heart. If you are moving into position against an unaware foe or striking without any warning, roll plus shadow. If you're ambushed, roll wits. On a strong hit, you get plus two momentum and you have initiative. On a weak hit, you can choose. On a miss, combat begins with you at a disadvantage. Pay the price, your foe has initiative. So. The whole bunch of stuff going on there, a lot of the stuff in this move. I don't need the gargoyle to be some terrible foe. I suspect they may be pretty common, at least around the outer grounds of the castle, but they're more than a basic farmer with an angry pitchfork. So I'm going to make this a dangerous opponent, which means they inflict two harm when they hit, and it take, they take two progress along the track, the 10 progress track per harm. So let's say I hit them for two harm. If I hit them for two harm, they will take four ticks, four boxes, not ticks. They'll take four boxes of progress along a track that sort of maps the, pro the progress of the fight. So then I need to roll to determine who is in control. Oh, I get to roll plus heart because I'm facing off against my foe. Nice. Burning 10 momentum on a basic roll reminded me that I didn't envision Brigida being very stealthy and that I didn't give her the stats to pull it off. Uh, I'm glad I'm rolling hard on this one. So very cool. Let's check out what the roll is. Now, you could argue that since it dropped down and it was um, a complication from a week hit before that I could I could say it was an ambush and I'd be rolling plus wits. But honestly, with this roll, it doesn't matter. Um, plus wits is still going to give me an eight over a two and a three. So it's still going to be a strong hit. So very cool. I have initiative, which does not mean what it means in D&D. &D. That's that's a key thing to remember. It does not mean what it means in D&D. &D. Um, and I get plus two on my momentum track, which moves things in a slightly happier direction than the one 
point of init of uh, momentum that I have right now. So with initiative, I can go for a strike, which is a move that acknowledges that I have the edge here instead of clash, which is a much riskier move in in a melee exchange. Basically, strike lets me sort of hit, and there's a very there's very little chance that I'm going to get hit back. I'm going to take consequences in return, which with, where with clash. Uh, I'm much more likely to be, it's going to be an exchange of blows. They hit me, I hit them, or other bad stuff happens. So Brigitte's Charge isn't a means of closing the distance. It, it, it is the attack. Um, in a very real sense, her momentum only builds as she charges across the courtyard, each step coming faster than the last. She smashes straight into the gargoyle, leading with her heavy reinforced shield. The mace blow she follows up with is almost an afterthought. And I'm going to roll strike. <sighs> It's super neat when I write up a really cool opening attack and the dice just screw me. Ah oh well. So the gargoyle is ready for Briggs' attack. It catches the shield with both of its clawed hands, absorbing the impact even as it is pushed back a few steps. It takes the mace strike on a shoulder like a teenager shrugging off a younger sibling's attack in a pillow fight, and then reaches over the shield with a stony claw. Now, Brigida likewise turns a shoulder to protect herself from the claw, and the thing gets the strap of my backpack, pulling and then tearing it. Triple stitched, reinforced leather tears like wet paper, and half the contents of my pack spray across the courtyard. First at the thing, first as the thing tears at it, and then as Brigida pulls back and throws the backpack to the side. So that's since it is a dangerous foe and would do to harm. It's taking two points of supply out of my five or whatever based on the Oracle result. So, super. Also, the thing has initiative now, which means I am clashing rather than striking. So I mark off supply. Um, I shuck the pack away and wade back in, stalking now rather than charging. And I'm going to, rather than strike, I'm going to clash. This is both a riskier move and I'm not rolling any better. God dang it. All right, I cannot get a break. Okay, keeping it a bit more simple this time, I'm just going for the obvious pay the price of enduring harm. The thing's claws are just tearing through my gear like it's nothing. I'm going to take two harm since this is a dangerous foe and then I have to roll to endure harm. So this is a key thing. Um, once you take the harm, I have five, I have five harm I can take on my sheet. Um, you take that. So I've taken two harm. So that's like, that's scary. That's 40% of my hit points. Now that's not exactly how it works, but it, it's a lot. Okay. So I it definitely, the hits hit harder. All right. So I take my two harm and then I have to roll to deal with it, to deal with the shock. Okay. Which can go in my advantage if I roll really well, or it can go against me and the, and the hit can actually be even worse than the basic two points would two points of harm would would indicate so i have to do that to see how that works now again when i endure harm i can do one of two things i can either roll iron or i can roll my current health after i take the hit so i got hit for two now i'm down to three health so three i'd be rolling plus three or i can roll my iron which is a plus two now so my iron is still lower i'm going to roll my plus health uh, there's a point at which with these where when your health starts to get lower, your spirit starts to get lower, where your stats will sort of step in and do better for you than rolling your, your health. But in this case, I'm still at advantage to it's it's to my advantage to just roll plus my health to see how I endure this harm. Nice. I don't know how to feel about being more lucky when it comes time to take a beating than to give a beating. But you know what? I will take it. Uh the eight comes from the plus one I get from my ironclad asset. I have a an asset, one of my three assets, called ironclad, which gives me a plus one. Uh, it gives me a plus one on my roll to endure harm, and it also gives me a plus one momentum if I get a hit, which I will happily take. So a strong hit on endure harm means that I can choose either to trade a point of momentum to take a point of health back. Or I can take another plus one momentum. In the long term, I'm probably going to want the health. It's harder to recover than momentum. But that plus five momentum might help me turn the tide of the battle right now. Also, I should give some thought to that match. Because I did beat double sixes. And that, should be, that gives me an opportunity. And I want it to be a real one this time. I've been kind of bad about making my positive matches kind of weak. 
sometimes. So, okay. I'm going to take the heal option, I think. But I think that the match lets um, Brigida take initiative back. So, Brig would have sworn she was wearing armor, but you'd never know it from the way this thing is tearing at her. If it weren't for her shield, and for the years of training against her mentor, who is also bigger and stronger than she is, uh, she would be cooling meat on the cobblestones already. But even so, she's reeling and stumbling back. And then an arrow skips off of the thing's head. Then another, snapping and striking sparks. Ismark is stringing a third arrow, and his sister is at his side, sword out and at the ready for the thing's charge in case it turns on them. The gargoyle turns, lowers its head, growls somehow, it doesn't even have a throat, and takes two steps before Brigida crashes back into it from the side. Since I have initiative, I can roll strike instead of clash, which is less risky, but... Ah, hell! As I've said before, I have pondered on several occasions whether or not I should move Brigida into the challenging stat array, giving her a plus one to basically all of her stats because she's basically playing solo. But the fact of the matter is, I have never missed a, I have yet to miss a roll by anything close enough uh, that one more point would matter. And this is no exception. I, I'm just getting killed. This is a flat out rolling a one against some pretty good dice. So I need to pay the price, but I don't want to just get hit point them back and forth so let's keep it interesting and see what the oracle says uh i don't want to just take damage so let's let's see if the oracle gives me something more interesting huh <laughs> okay fine asshole oracle anyway i take two harm again and endure harm again with a plus one from ironclad uh and rolling my health which is still even with my iron at this point in time because it was down to three it went up by one to a four because i healed from the last one and then it went from a four down to a two and two is the same as my iron so it's a wash i can roll either one i chose to roll health so same situation as last time but without the twist i am not going to pick anything else either i don't relish trying to get my health back up in an enemy castle so i want to mitigate as much of that as i can this means my health is back up from a two to a three and my momentum stays steady at three thanks to getting one from my ironclad and then trading it right away again twice uh the charge was exactly as effective as the last one get behind me I shout at Ismark and Irina. My shield is up and I'm circling the thing, trying to maneuver it somewhere useful. Further back into the courtyard? No. Wait, we can go further in. Yes, yes, maybe. Find another gate, something we can get between us and the thing. Try to get past and see what's ahead. This is risky. So we're going to do face danger. When you attempt something risky or react to an imminent threat, envision your action and roll. If I want to act with speed and agility and precision, I would roll edge. If I want to act with charm, loyalty, or courage, roll heart. If I'm using aggressive action, forceful defense, strength, or endurance, I roll iron. If I'm using deception, strength, or trickery, I roll shadow, or I use expertise, insight, and observation, roll wits. I'm using my shield as cover, which gives me a plus one for facing danger, which I will take whatever break I can. And I'm going to roll iron because I'm using aggressive action, forceful defense in this case, uh, and my endurance. So we'll see how that goes. Oh, and that plus one, from my shield is just what I needed for a strong hit. I could, I could, I could kiss my shield right now. Probably will kiss it later, don't judge me. So, new plan, looks a little something like this. Get to the choppa. I'm in the courtyard here, and I'm gonna try and get back to this back gate. Going to try to secure advantage while Ismark and Irina slip past me and I keep this stony bastard busy. The good news is the gate's up, calls out Ismark. The bad news is it's probably rusted in place, so I'm Securing advantage, rolling plus heart. I, I'm going to remind people again that securing advantage, I don't end up using it very often because in the in this version of the game, because it's not very good. It's certainly weaker than it is in Starforged, and uh, in this case, all I get is a plus one momentum. It, I mean, it's a net good, sure. Um, it's no worse than a strong face danger, uh, so that's fine. Uh, fine. I grip my teeth and plant myself in front of the opening of the gate and ready myself for the thing's next attack, wishing I had heavier iron, I, armor on, which would actually help me with my clash roll. Um, but I can't switch modes of light armor to heavy armor right now, obviously. Let's see how it goes. So I'm rolling clash instead of strike, which means that it's a little bit more risky, and I get a weak hit. Inflict your harm, but then pay the price. Your foe gets initiative, which, great. I finally hit, at least. That fills in the first four 
of the 10 progress boxes on this enemy. So I'm ready for the thing's claws this time mostly. I catch the first slash on the edge of my shield and then I bash it over the eye ridge with my mace right where Ismark's arrow left me a nice bright white target gash. The thing punches straight out with its other club-like fist right at my chest. Pay the price Oracle says it causes a delay or puts me at a disadvantage. I take their strike on the shield again. Seriously, totally having a shield make out session later. I cannot tell you how much I love this thing. I stumble back into the wall next to the gate and I slam into a release catch hidden beneath the vines on the wall. The small, small portcullis gate comes rattling down, narrowly missing Ismark and cutting me off from them. Our eyes meet through the grating. Well, shit, he says. I turn back toward the gargoyle and clench my jaw. Yes. I say. Then I charge. So I'm going with a new move called Turn the Tide. Once per fight, you risk it all. When you risk it all, you may steal initiative from your foe to make a move, not a progress move. When you do so, you can add plus one and take plus one momentum on a hit. But if you fail to score a hit on the move, you must suffer a dire outcome pay the price note this is stupid i want to acknowledge for the record how stupid this is before i roll so i'm going to turn the tide i'm trying to take back initiative so what happens is since i'm turning the tide i get a plus one on whatever roll i do and i get to act as though i have initiative i've taken initiative back uh. so that means i get to go straight for a strike which is getting out of this fight is by getting away is no longer an easy or a very likely option thanks to that gate coming down and complicating things from my previous thing. So according to Turn the Tide, I get a plus one on my strike roll and a plus one momentum on the hit. So cross all your fingers. Yes. Okay. <sighs> I get plus one on the roll, plus one momentum on the hit. Yes. On the strong hit, inflict plus one harm and you retain initiative. Hell yes. So that's three harm, each one of which fills in two boxes on the progress track. So I get the pro that's I already had four boxes filled in on the progress track, and this takes the track with six more boxes because I get two for each one. That takes me to maxed out with all ten of the boxes filled. So I'm coming off a strong hit. I have initiative, so let's end this fight. I'm not being poetic here. There's actually a move called end the fight. When you make a move to take decisive action and score a strong hit, you may resolve the outcome of this fight. This is tricky because you have to take decisive action and score a strong hit. You have to finish strong. You have to score a strong hit. You may resolve the outcome of the fight. If you do, you roll the two challenge dice and compare your progress. Momentum is ignored on this roll, so I can't burn momentum to make this hit work better. So on a strong hit, the foe is no longer in the fight. They're killed. They're out of the action. They flee. They surrender. Whatever's appropriate to your uh, situation and your intent. On a weak hit, same thing, but you have to choose some mitigating downside i have a 10 i effectively rolled a 10 all i have to do is roll my challenge dice and if i beat both of my challenge dice it works out well for me seriously fuck you dice <laughs> all right i got a weak hit i with a 10 i okay on a weak hit the foe is no longer in the fight but i also have to choose it's worse than i thought i have to endure harm again you are overcome you have to endure stress your victory is short-lived because a new danger or a new foe appears or an existing danger gets worse. You suffer collateral damage, something of value is lost or broken, or someone important has to pay the cost. You will pay for it. An objective of yours falls out of reach or others won't forget. You are marked for vengeance. Okay, so the creature wasn't expecting either the timing or the ferocity of my attack. My mace comes down once twice a third time claws shoved aside and then joints attacked until the stone begins to crack and once cracked begin to break i do not stop the smashing breaking growling attack does not let up until the thing is rubble at my feet and i am covered in thick violet ichor with an eye-watering sour odor i shuffle over to my pack retrieve the supplies that i can tie up my pack as best I can and shuffle back to the gate where Ismark is dragging the chains back up to open the gate to let me through. You smell... Irina begins, don't. I say, don't say it. I, I can't, I can't hear anyone else say it. I am picking others won't forget. You are marked for vengeance because seriously, fuck gargoyles. 